Hello, and welcome to this virtual presentation on medications, bolus insulin, and hypoglycemia. I want to thank Novo Nordisk for sponsoring this uh, presentation. So this is a copy of a presentation that I did in April, and I'll be breaking it up into two parts. In this first part, I'll be reviewing non-insulin medications, and in the next part, I will review bolus insulin calculations and hypoglycemia. So here's my disclosure slide. As you can see, I've spoken for a number of pharma companies, probably all the ones related to diabetes. And as I mentioned, we'll be reviewing non-insulin medications to treat diabetes, and I'll be going over GLP analogs in a little bit more detail. So the best way I think to approach uh, this chapter and this competency for the exam is to assume that you're the prescriber. Assume that the physician is going to go with whatever recommendation that you make and that responsibility for what happens to the patient is on your shoulders. And I think uh, for a lot of provinces, this is already in place or coming soon. I think RN prescribing will be here maybe this year or next year. Uh, pharmacists already have prescribing rights depending on which province you're in. And even dietitians have limited prescribing rights. So the best way to learn this chapter, in my opinion, is to assume that you are the prescriber. If the patient gets mad or hits you with a lawsuit, you must be able to point to your reasons why you chose that particular medication and defend your decision. Uh, so this will cover competency 3A for the exam. And I'm going to start off by reviewing a little bit of pathophysiology because I think that's the foundation for everything else. So you should be familiar with this diagram by now. Uh, the brain and the muscles at rest are using about 13 clicks of uh, 13 grams of glucose per hour. But if you look at if you took all the blood in my body, there's only about four grams of glucose in my blood. So we need some sort of storage mechanism to keep uh, the glucose coming, or I'd run out of glucose in like 20 minutes. Uh, that's where the liver and the muscles uh, come into play as they start store large amounts of glycogen which can be broken back down into glucose. So that way I don't have to eat every 20 minutes to stay alive. So I'm going to introduce a couple of other characters to this uh, story. First is the kidneys. Uh, the kidneys play a role in reabsorbing glucose from the urine. Initially, sugar is filtered out of the kidneys, but then the kidneys grab the sugar back from the urine and put it back into the blood. So why do you think it does this? Well, if, uh, let's say I don't have diabetes. Uh, but you knock out your, the kidney's ability to do, do its job reabsorbing glucose, then I'd be urinating out about 180 grams of glucose per day. Uh, that's about how much sugar the kidneys put back into the blood. So how much slices of bread is 180 grams equivalent to? Well, that's about 12 slices of bread, like almost like a loaf of bread. So imagine, even in this first world country, how much it would cost me to eat an extra loaf of bread every day. And if, and if like I was a caveman back in you know, the Stone Age and I urinated out a loaf of bread worth of energy and I had to forge that much more for that much extra food, I'd probably be the first to starve to death in a famine. So that's why the kidney has evolved to grab the sugar from the urine and put it back into the blood. The intestines also play a major role in first absorbing sugars, but also secreting incretins such as GLP-1. These incretins travel to the brain where they induce a satiety or feeling full. And some research suggests that uh, people with diabetes have uh, altered and disrupting signaling in the brain that affects their satiety. Uh, incretins also travel to the pancreas where they can help with insulin secretion and suppress glucagon, and which is important because glucagon is a counter-regulatory hormone and can raise sugars. So also very important is healthy eating and physical activity. Um, you know, I feel they're just as important as medications and it's very important to talk to your patient about it. Now, weight can be, can be a sensitive topic and you, sh you should always ask a patient if it's okay to talk about their weight. That makes them feel respected. It gives patients the option to talk or not because sometimes you know, they can be sensitive about it or they've heard this too many times already or you know, it's, just a, it's just a way to broach the topic. So, uh, so ask permission before you talk about a patient's weight and healthy eating and physical activity are always important. 
Um, yes, you should have memorized this diagram for now for the exam. And as you can see, healthy behavior interventions are talked about at all stages of diabetes. Okay, so these are the classes of medications that I'm going to go through today. And so the first one is biguanides, and the most, the, the one in this class is metformin. And how do they work? Uh, why is enhancing insulin activity in the liver important? Well, that results in a reduction in hepatic glucose production. Remember, there's up to 75 grams of glycogen in the liver that can be broken down in glucose. So it's really important that the liver gets the insulin, insulin signal that, hey, there's lots of sugar in the blood, you don't need to break down that glycogen into, into uh, sugar and dump it into the blood. You know, a lot of patients will uh, ask me, you know, hey, like, why are my sugars going up at night? You know, I'm not eating anything. Am I sleep, am I sleep, eat, sleep eating or something like that? And I tell them that, hey, your liver stores 75 grams of glycogen. That can leak into your system if you don't have enough insulin signals to the liver. And that's what metformin help, helps with. Um, you, know, you know, you're not sleep eating or anything like that. It's normal. You're not alone in that. Uh, you know, nothing to panic about. So the most common side effect with metformin is GI distress. And you can, there's a couple of ways you can get around that. The first is uh, slow titration. Uh, you can start very low. I usually start, when I prescribe it, I usually start with half a tablet twice a day. And then I slowly go up, up you know, probably every one or two weeks. Uh, you can also prescribe uh, extended release formulations like Lumetza. Uh, I found that that actually quite helps with uh, the GI upset. And now Glumetza is generic, so a lot of plans will cover it. So talking about risk of hypoglycemia, it's pretty low, um, especially when you use it by itself. And, and that's because metformin isn't uh, stimulating insulin uh, or uh, simulating insulin like a sulfonylurea or putting insulin into the system like insulin. Um, now, hypoglycemia is zero, but relative to other medications, it's actually quite, quite low. For weight gain, uh, it's neutral. Uh, you know, some people lose a little bit of weight on it, but not, not, not everyone does. Basically, metformin's neutral for weight gain. Uh, the UK PDS did show a reduction in myocardial infarctions in overweight individuals. And for CV studies, uh, yeah, there was a reduction in myocardial infarction, other considerations. Um, renal adjustment, uh, metformin is cleared by the kidneys. So if you do have declining renal function, you need to renally adjust it. The concern is that if metformin levels build up in the body, this could uh, lead to a side effect called lactic acidosis. Uh, it's very, very rare though. Um, you know, some of the nephrologists that I work with, they, um, they prescribe metformin up until very low renal functions, like 10, they'll still have patients on metformin. And I think that's because Lactic acidosis was mostly seen in fenformin, which was the medication before metformin. And fenformin did actually cause a lot of lactic acidosis. However, with metformin, it's actually very, very rare. And some nephrologists are very cavalier about it and prescribe it to very low uh, renal, renal adjustments. For the exam though, follow exactly what it says in the guidelines. Like, in real life, maybe you can be a little bit loose with the dosages, but for the exam, you must follow exactly what it says in the guidelines, or you'll go, you're going to get the question wrong. Um, there's also a B12 deficiency, which is rare, but you can just check out lab work occasionally. Okay, so sample question. So I'll just give you a, se a second to uh, read that over. Just pause it here if you want. But the answer is, Yes. So watch out for these not questions. Uh, not be appropriate means just appropriate. And so even with a GFR of 40, you can still use a small dose of metformin. Uh, metformin is contraindicated in type 1 diabetes, though 
again, some specialists do use it to, for, the, for the insulin sensitivity benefit. But again, for the exam, that is wrong. Metformin is contraindicated. Uh, metformin should not be used with excessive alcohol use. Uh, the risk of hypoglycemia is actually higher if the patient also is consuming alcohol. Uh, because when your liver is dealing with the alcohol, it can't break down glycogen into glucose if, you, if the patient's sugars drop too low. Dealing with alcohol uses up one of the liver's enzymes that is used to break down glycogen. And then with severe dehydration, you should know about the SADMANS, and the M in the SADMANS stands for the metformin. Okay. So let's go to alpha glucosidase inhibitors. So what these do is they inhibit enzymes that break down sugars. And let's see here. And the hypoglycemia risk is really low. Um, but on the exam, there always seems to be a question about hypoglycemia and uh, a carbose. Remember that you need to use pure dextrose or milk lactose to treat lows while on a carbose or glucobay, uh, because glucobay inhibits the breakdown of sucrose into fructose and glucose. Um, well, weight gain is neutral. Uh, GI side effects are quite common. A lot of my patients complain about excessive gas on it. Uh, but supposedly, uh, it's a very popular drug in, in China. Uh, requires three days, three times a day's dosing. Overall, it's kind of a, a kind of a weaker but safe drug. I often use these in very frail or elderly patients. Okay, so insulin secretagogues. So what these medications do is that they activate the uh, a receptor on the beta cells in the pancreas and kind of force it to secrete insulin. Uh, because it's forcing insulin secretion, there is some risk of hypoglycemia. It's less uh, with glycoside and repaglinide, but moderate with glyburide. Weight gain there is some, because anytime you're simulating insulin secretion, insulin is an anabolic hormone, you're going to get weight gain. And there is a possible increase in severe risk and mortality with glyburide. Um, generally in Alberta, I need to use these medications first before I can uh, get newer medications covered. Uh, so yeah, so newer medications like SGLT2 inhibitors. So um, as I mentioned before, the kidneys yank sugar back from the urine into the bloodstream. And these SGLT inhibitors uh, inhibit that basically. There's two types of SGLT2, one and two. But, so these, me these medications inhibit it. Uh, so side effects. Uh, if, you can, if you can kind of try to understand it, then you, don't have, you can memorize less. So basically, if you've got a lot of sugar in your urine, then what can that increase? Well, bacteria love sugar and multiply a lot. Yeast loves sugar and use, eat it and multiply a lot. So this can uh, lead to uh, you know, yeast infections and urinary tract infections. You also have, now sugar also acts as a, to grab water. And so it has a little bit of a diuretic effect to SGLT inhibitors. A lot of patients will mention that, hey, they, they're going to the washroom more often. And because it has a bit of a diuretic effect, it almost acts like one of those five side diur diuretics. So it can reduce your, a patient's blood pressure. So you have to be kind of careful. If their blood pressure is kind of low already, if they're like, say like 100 over 50, they have orthostatic hypotension, um, dizziness and stuff like that, you, just, you need to be careful with a SGLT2 inhibitor. Often I'll try to discontinue their FISA diuretic and replace it with this to try to like not over burden, overburden patients with pills. So you do need to watch out for hypotension, and a lot of them are contraindicated under certain GFR, because uh, if the kidneys aren't working, then stopping the kidneys from not working doesn't have any effect. There's also rare cases of uh, ketoac ketoacidosis, uh, which may or may occur with what hy hyperglycemia, which is, an, which is a oddity. So you do need to watch out for that and counsel them on sad men so that if they get dehydrated, then it's very, very important to uh, stop this medication to try to avoid ketoacidosis. 
uh, risk of hypoglycemia is quite low. And uh, especially when you're using it as monotherapy. And these, do, these medications do have the benefit of weight loss. As you're urinating out that sugar, you're urinating, urinating out calories, and that has a bit of a weight loss side effect. So uh, when, if I'm trying to sell this medication to a patient, that's like the first thing I mentioned. Because once you mention weight gain, a lot of patients will be like, yes, I'll, I'll, take, I'll be compliant with this medication. I'm willing, willing to take it. Okay. And then a lot of these medications also do have reductions in uh, major adverse cardiovascular events. Um, there's uh, new studies that show that they have benefits in heart failure and preventing renal disease. So very useful uh, class of medications. Okay, so let's do a sample question. Um, if you want, you can just pause here if you want to just read the question. I didn't put the answer on. And so the answer to this one is that SGLT2 receptors uh, work at blood glucose levels uh, above 10. And uh, so answer B is the correct one. Um, as I mentioned, there's SGLT2-1 and SGLT2. Uh, SGLT2, SGLT1s work when the sugars are low and SGLT twos work when the sugars are high. So that's why uh, they have a low risk of hypoglycemia. When you reduce the sugar below a certain amount, they just, their SGLT2s aren't working anyway. And so uh, it uh, has minimal risk of hypoglycemia. Yeah, so that one's, the answer is, to that one is B. And here's my next sample question. So just pause it here if you just want to read that. This is a bit of a longer question. And here we go. So the answer is D for this one. So why, so here's why each question, each answer is wrong. So by durion, um, all the GLP-1s have a contraindication where if they have a certain type of thyroid cancer, that the medication is contraindicated. That's because they found that in rats, it induced um, this very rare medullary thyroid cancer. So this guy has a history of thyroid cancer. He doesn't know what it is, but um, until we figure out what that is, it wouldn't be the best uh, medication for him. Uh, he's erratic meals, so dimicron may cause hypoglycemia, which is not great. He's also driving semi-trailer, semi so we really want to avoid hypoglycemia while driving with him. Same thing with uh, diabetes, same thing with dimicron. So gluconorm is great because you can just dose it with his erratic meals. Um, so if he has a meal, he takes the gluconorm, and if he doesn't, then he just skips it. So reduces his risk of hypoglycemia. So D would be the best uh, would be the best medication for this patient. So now we're going to talk about uh, medications like pioglizone. The thiazolidiones class. It's actually really hard to pronounce. Uh, what these medications do is basically they enhance insulin sensitivity in the in the in the tissues. Um, hypoglycemia is uh, very rare with them, uh, especially as monotherapy. Now, weight gain they do uh, cause some weight gain, and that's because they're uh, some. Be, because they cause, uh, they can cause an edema sometimes. And you're also doing some insulin sensitivity. So it's kind of like increasing the insulin action, action, but not, not, not as much as like metformin. Metformin's main mechanism of action is uh, on the liver and not insulin sensitivity. So that's why Actos and those things can cause uh, a bit of weight gain because they mainly work just on uh, insulin sensitivity, and because it can cause some edema. Uh, for cardiovascular outcomes, it's neutral for pioglitazone. And then there was this controversy with rosiglitazone, uh, with, where it, it may have increased MI risk. So as a class, this medication is kind of falling out of favor. It's not uh, used as much anymore. I, I don't use it very much, but it can still show up on the exam. And still, there's some, there's still a lot of patients on Actos. I still have a couple of patients on Actos. Um, 
also, when you combine it with insulin, it seemed to cause a lot of weight gain. You would think something that improves insulin sensitivity and uh, give them insulin would really work, but it actually didn't work that well and caused a lot of edema. So it, it's not contraindicated to use insulin in Actos, but it's not indicated either. Um, it, but they are con these medications are contraindicated in congestive heart failure because they can induce edema, which worsens heart failure. They, they also have this bizarre risk of atypical fractures, and pioglodazone is not to be used with bladder cancer. These medications also take a really long time to work, uh, almost about six to 12 weeks for maximal effect. So if you're kind of, you know, adjusting the dose weekly or something like that, that's not going to work. You have to wait six to 12 weeks before uh, you can see the maximal effect. So almost at your next A1C, basically. All right, DPP-4 inhibitors. So uh, they work by, uh, so there's an enzyme called DPP-4 that chews up the incretins that our intestines secrete after a meal. And so by inhibiting DPP-4, you extend the life of those incretins. Not as strong as GLP-1 analogs, uh, you can almost think of these medications as a weaker version of GLP-1 analogs. And uh, with, the, with the new medication Rivalysis out, the new oral GLP-1, I think eventually those medications, those this class of medications, the DPP-4s, will, will be replaced by oral GLP-1s. But um, that's how they work, by uh, inhibiting DPP-4, which increases uh, incretin activity. In terms of hypoglycemia, it's pretty rare, uh, negligible risk. Weight gain, even though they're affecting the incretin system, they weren't strong enough to uh, induce weight gain. So weight gain is neutral. Cardiovascular incomes is neutral. Uh, some other considerations are rare cases of pancreatitis and joint pain, and caution with saxagliptin in patients. So I don't know why participants, in patients with heart failure. Okay, so on to the GLP analogs. So there's a lot in this class now. Um, I'm gonna show you a slide later that shows you uh, how, why there are so many. And again, these, you can think of these as uh, stronger versions of DPP-4s. So usually when I have a patient on a DPP-4 and I start them on a GLP-1, I'll eventually phase out the DPP-4. So they work by, uh, they work as an artificial incretin that increases the uh, incretin levels in the body. That has the effect of slowing gastric emptying, going to the pancreas to increase insulin secretion, but also uh, decreasing glucagon, suppressing glucagon secretion as well, and going to the brain to induce satiety. Uh, so the risk of uh, hypoglycemia is negligible. Uh, you do get uh, quite a bit of weight loss. You get some weight loss with it, more than SGLT2s generally. Uh, also, there's lots, of, uh, uh, there's lots of evidence that show that these medications reduce major adverse cardio cardiovascular events. Um, some, of, some, of the, some of the GLP-1 analogs, not, not all of them. And uh, the most common side effect is not... GI side effects, because it is a GI hormone. People get nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. You can uh, try to slow down the rate of increase of the GLP analog to uh, reduce these side effects in your patients. If the you know, patients get, if I increase the dose and the patients get some side effects, then I'll just lower the dose back down, wait a couple of weeks and try to increase it again. For a lot of the pens actually, like with a Victoza pen, Dosempic pen and things like that, there's like kind of like 10 clicks in between each dose increment and you can dose it that way too. So say I had, a, so say you have a patient, uh, they're on 0 0.6 of Victoza, you try to increase it to 1.2, but they complain, oh my God, I, I, been throwing up constantly. So go back to the 0 0.6 and go and wait a couple of weeks, then go 0 0.6 plus five clicks and then see how they do on that. And then after a couple of weeks, do another five clicks. So you can just try to increase it slower, slower for them. Yeah. Okay. And so, um, you know, DGA plate when analogs are injections, but they come in daily injections and once weekly injections, which is convenient, which is convenient. Yeah, when, oh, they're contraindicated in uh, any 
family history of that specific type of thyroid cancer. So when GLP-1s first came out, uh, like when Victoza first came out, it was great for getting people eventually onto insulin. Like uh, for patients who are absolutely opposed to injections, you tell them that, hey, this injection can help you lose weight. And like 90% of the time, like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. And then once they get comfortable injections, then afterwards it's like, okay, you know, we've tried this maxing out of Victoza, but your A1C is still high. Now can we, you know, add a slight bit of insulin? And they're like, okay, I'm comfortable with injections now. I'll, I'll, I'm accepting of it. Whereas when, if you just try to uh, get them on insulin right away, they're like, fight it tooth and nail. So yeah, maybe that's a way, something that you could do to uh, help your patients uh, you know, transition onto insulin. We, as we know, like it, diabetes is a progressive disease. Um, eventually, a lot of patients will need insulin. So having that conversation early can get, can get them in the right uh, frame of mind for that eventually. Okay, so here's a sample question. Just pause it here if you need, and here is the answer. Okay, so for this one, uh, D is incorrect because you can't use it in people with uh, type one diabetes. Uh, C is incorrect because uh, of the thyroid cancer. So anorexia is not a contraindication for uh, uh, Ozempic and neither is hypothyroidism. It's just the specific types of cancer. And uh, obesity is definitely not a contraindication in A. Uh, obesity is not a definitely not a contraindication to Ozempic. And you can use Ozempic if it's 30 mils or more. So A and B are correct and C and D are wrong. Okay. So uh, as you can see, there's lots of ways to manipulate the incretin uh, GLP, GLP hormone to make it last longer. And so that's why there's so many of them. So many of them are out there. So, oh, this does it automatically. So there's lots of parameters that affect uh, type two diabetes. There's decreased insulin secretion of beta cells. Uh, that leads to increased hepatic glucose production. Increased lipolysis means that there's increased uh, free fatty acids, impaired appetite regulation. Uh, without uh, beta cell, alpha cells secrete glucagon. And if the beta cells and alpha cells aren't communicating, if the beta cells are having dysfunction, there's sometimes increased glucagon secretion, uh, decreased incretin effect from the intestines, increased reabsorption, and decreased insulin, increased insulin resistance, leading to decreased glucose uptake in the muscles. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, oh, this is automatically. And so uh, GLP-1s have a lot of effects that can benefit the uh, multifactorial, the, all the type 2 diabetes uh, pathophysiology. Uh, the main effects are on brain, on the brain with satiety, the pancreas and the GI tract, but it does help reduce lipotoxicity. Um, the, with the kidneys, it's interesting, but theoretically, GLPs may help kidney with sodium excretion. Uh, so it's possible, there's some studies that show that, you know, uh, GLP analogs help with uh, kidney function, and this might be the key to that. But that's theoretical and that's, that's not on the test. But GLPs do have a wide array of effects that can help with type 2 diabetes. Okay, so this slide looks uh, at uh, Ozem uh, Ozempic or semaglutide in particular. As you can see uh, at different doses, it did decrease the A1C more than other GLP analogs. Uh, same thing with body weight. As you can see, semaglutide did reduce weight more than other GLP analogs. And so this is just a this is just a summary slide. Uh, as you know, uh, Ozempic does reduce A1C, weight, uh, and improves uh, things like glucose metabolism and uh, blood pressure as well. Yeah. Okay, so thanks so much for your attention. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to email me 
at uh, cdestudycourse at gmail.com. Please check out my website for sample quizzes. And I'll have the second part of this presentation on bolus insulin calculations and hypoglycemia uploaded probably, probably within a couple of days. Thank you so much for your attention.